Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this Institute lecture. After the lecture, there'll be a reception to which you're all invited in Ford Hall. Today, our speaker is Scott Tremaine, who joined the Institute as Richard Black Professor in the School of Natural Sciences in January 2007. Scott obtained his bachelor's degree from McMaster University in Ontario in 1971 and his PhD from Princeton University in 1975. He held postdoctoral positions at Caltech, at Cambridge University, and for three years here at the Institute, before becoming an associate professor at MIT in 1981. In 1985, he moved to become the founding director of the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics and a professor in the University of Toronto. In 1997, he came to Princeton as, as a professor in the university's uh, Department of Astrophysics, serving as its chair from 1998 to 2006, and becoming Charles A. Young Professor in 2002. Scott has very many distinctions and awards to his name, including honorary foreign membership of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Fellowship of the Royal Society of Canada and the Royal Society of London, and membership of the National Academy of Sciences. He is one of the world's leading experts on astrophysical dynamics, including the formation and evolution of planetary systems, comets, black holes, star clusters, galaxies, and galaxy systems. Today, his title is The Fifth Element, Astrophysical Evidence for Black Holes, Dark Matter, and Dark Energy. Scott. Thank you. In order to start, I'd like to give a very quick 10-minute uh, uh, run through the entire history uh, of astronomy and astrophysics, um, starting with the Greeks. Um, as everyone knows, in Greek philosophy, uh, the material on the Earth was divided into four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, uh, which were uh, subject to change because of the complex phenomena uh, on the Earth. Um, but in addition, at least according to Plato and Aristotle, there was a fifth element, uh, the ether, which was found only in the heavens and which was immutable and unchangeable. Um, this was reflected, at least to some extent, in, in Greek astronomy, which, of course, was geocentric. The Earth was at the center of the universe. Uh, it contained eight spheres, uh, seven holding the known planets, and the last uh, holding the stars, which were surrounded uh, by this um, immutable ether. Uh, the next major change in our uh, outlook on, on the universe uh, came in the uh, Middle Ages with Copernicus, the Polish astronomer, who argued that the sun rather than the earth uh, was the center of the solar system. Uh, so uh, in this, these little cartoons, Ptolemy's view, uh, Plato's view with the earth at the center and the sun orbiting around it is replaced by one with the sun at the center and the earth orbiting around it. Um, the importance of uh, Copernicus's insight was uh, not just the fact that he completely revised the geometry of the solar system, but also that he uh, demoted the Earth from being the center of the universe. Uh, it was now, instead of being the center, just one of many planets orbiting the sun. Um, and this was such a, a major uh, change in our view of the universe uh, that it's come to be encapsulated uh, by astronomers in what's called the Copernican Principle, which says we're not located at a special place or a special time in the universe, and any time you have a model of what's going on in the universe that uh, makes our current location special or the current time special, uh, then it's probably wrong. The next step after Copernicus uh, was Newton, uh, who famously deduced the law of universal uh, gravitation while sitting uh, outside this house uh, uh, under this apple tree, and he was inspired when he saw an apple fall to Earth, although not uh, this apple. Um, and um, Newton rec Newton's insight was that the uh, uh, law of gravity that caused the apple to fall to Earth was the same law that governed the motion of the, the moon and planets, that they were falling in precisely uh, the same way. Uh, one of the consequences of this uh, was that the speed of a planet um, declines uh, with its distance away from uh, the sun, a uh, prediction which was uh, uh, known to be true uh, as an empirical fact. Um, and again, the importance of Newton's insight was not just the fact that he understood 
uh, the dynamics of the solar system, but also that he recognized that the laws of physics that can be investigated in the laboratory um, should also apply and can be used to describe the behavior of the stars and planets. That is, that what we learn by experiments on Earth can be applied uh, to the heavens. Um, the next step in, uh, trying to un in understanding uh, the nature of the heavens came from looking at uh, spectra of the sun. Uh, as you're familiar with, uh, in the case of a rainbow, uh, either a glass prism or droplets of water can disperse uh, the light from the sun into its constituent uh, colors. Uh, and the person who uh, looked at this most carefully was Joseph Fraunhofer, uh, using a prism uh, in his laboratory in sunlight, he discovered that the, the light from the sun was interspersed with very fine, dark, uh, narrow lines. Um, not only uh, did he find these lines, now called Fraunhofer lines, he recognized that they were a property of the sun rather than uh, the Earth's atmosphere. And he also noticed that if he looked at the spectrum of a flame uh, from a burning substance in, the lab in his laboratory, he could see some of the same uh, spectral lines. And he concluded that each chemical element is associated with a set of spectral lines. And the fact that the dark lines in the solar spectrum are the same as the dark lines that you see in flames in the laboratory means that the sun is composed of the same elements as the Earth. And this, has been, this insight has been extended. This is a modern uh, solar spectrum. Uh, which is, should be read like a book. That is, it's been split up so that it, uh, uh, you read across the lines um, in the same way you would read a book. Um, not only did, he did, did the solar spectra show that the sun was composed of the same elements as the Earth, but it also led to new discoveries. Um, in particular, later in the century, some Fraunhofer lines were discovered that weren't associated with any known element. And the people who, the spectroscopists who discovered these lines said that they must be associated with some new element that had not yet been discovered on Earth, and they uh, proposed to call it helium. This was actually how the element helium was discovered. It was only isolated on the Earth some uh, 30 years later. Um, and the lesson of this for the first time was not just that physics can tell you how the heavenly bodies uh, behave, but that um, studying uh, astronomical objects uh, can teach you about uh, new physics. Uh, although the, the sun is uh, made of the same elements of, as the Earth, it's not made in the same mix. Uh, it's now realized that um, the mix of elements in the sun is very different from the Earth, presumably because uh, of loss of elements during the formation of the Earth. Uh, the sun's 75% hydrogen, 23% helium, and all the other elements in the sun only comprise about 2% of its uh, total mass. Um, this is true for other stars as well, and it leads to the conclusion that hydrogen and helium are the, by far the main constituents of the universe in roughly a three to one uh, ratio, with all the other elements heavier than hydrogen and helium being only a minor pollutant uh, on these two uh, elements. Um, this discovery uh, was actually made in a, a wonderful uh, PhD thesis uh, at Harvard by C Cecilia Payne. Um, uh, not only is she famous for this, um, for this insight, uh, but she also uh, played a, a, an important role in the gradual acceptance of women um, in, as academic researchers in the United States in the 20th century. She got the first PhD in astronomy from Harvard. She was the first woman promoted uh, to the tenured faculty at Harvard um, and the first one to head a department at Harvard. Once astronomers understood that, uh, uh, what the constituents of the stars were, they began to think even more ambitious thoughts and began to wonder about the formation of the elements themselves. Uh, this is a remarkable uh, uh, act of uh, uh, hubris or chutzpah, um, not to think not only that you can understand the nature of the elements in the universe, but where they came from. It almost treads on, on theology. And an example of how revolutionary it was is a, a nice quote from Charles Darwin, who, of course, was thinking about speciation and the theory of evolution. Somebody asked him uh, if he had thought about the origin of life itself, and he said, it's rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think about the origin of matter. Uh, but in fact, in the intervening century and a half, astronomers have thought about the origin of matter, and we now know much more about it uh, than uh, we do about the origin uh, of life. Um, 
So the, the way to think about uh, the origin of matter is to go back to the periodic table that um, you saw in chemistry classes in high school. It organizes all of the elements in terms of their atomic number, uh, starting with the lightest element, hydrogen, then helium, and working their way up uh, to elements with atomic number of about 100. And you can use spectroscopy to determine the uh, relative abundance of each of these elements um, in the stars. And what you find is that the abundance as a function of the atomic number exhibits this remarkably rich and detailed structure. The abundances of the elements vary over factors of uh, a thousand million, about a billion, um, and there's this remarkably detailed uh, sawtooth structure with some elements relatively common, some extremely rare. And it's a tremendous challenge to try to understand why this uh, peculiar and rich behavior should have developed in the formation of the elements. Um, in order to talk about this, I want to just uh, remind you of uh, uh, the, the neighborhood that the sun uh, resides in. When you look at the sky uh, on a dark night, uh, not so easy in New Jersey, um, you see a band of light uh, crossing the sky, which is the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is visible both from the northern hemisphere uh, and from the southern hemisphere. Um, if you look at the Milky Way with a telescope, it resolves itself into a vast number of stars. And in fact, the, the Milky Way um, is, consists of the stars in our own galaxy. Um, the reason it has this curious sort of mottled appearance is because the stars are accompanied by uh, small particles of what you might think of as smoke or dust, just small solid, solid particles. Um, that means that in effect we're looking at these stars through a, a swirling kind of fog and uh, sometimes you look at an area like this one through a fairly dense part of the fog, or even denser parts here, and other times you can see much further away and that gives it this, um, this uh, irregular appearance. Um, I've just pointed out here two uh, other smaller galaxies that are satellites of our own galaxy, the large and small Magellanic clouds visible in the southern hemisphere. Uh, they'll reappear in the story uh, a little later on. Um, because of this uh, 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 fog and smoke, we can't see all the way to the center of the galaxy, um, but we can do better if we use, rather than visible light, infrared light for the same reason really that the Army uh, uses uh, infrared detectors uh, for uh, looking through uh, fog and smoke on the battlefield. Um, when you do that, you can get images like this. This is a picture of the whole sky flattened down uh, onto the plane of the, the, the screen, showing the center of the galaxy here. Still some dust, um, but a much uh, clearer view than we get in visible light. Uh, the disk of the galaxy here, if we were looking at the galaxy from outside, the sun would be about here, and there's uh, one of the Magellanic Clouds. The total number of stars in the galaxy is about um, 100,000 million stars, um, and the Milky Way is just a typical, ordinary, middle-class uh, galaxy. We see many other galaxies uh, similar to that um, at much larger uh, distances uh, from, from us. Um, in addition to these small solid particles and the stars, galaxies like the Milky Way contain um, gas as well. Um, mixed in between the stars and the, 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 these dust particles that give these dark lanes um, is about 10% of the same amount of mass in, in just gas between the stars. That gas slowly cools off, gravitationally clumps and forms new stars. So um, the reason that we see uh, uh, relatively young stars in here is because stars are constantly being formed um, in the galaxy. Not only are they being formed, but uh, old stars die, and occasionally um, the most massive stars die in a very violent way through an enormous explosion uh, called a supernova. Uh, this is an example of a supernova in a distant galaxy. You can see the image of the galaxy before the supernova, and then the light from the supernova, which temporarily, at least for a period, of a few weeks or months outshines the combined light of all the other stars uh, in the galaxy. Um, this supernova was a very long way away. You have to look a long way away because they're very rare, but you do occasionally have supernova in our own galaxy. The most recent one nearby was uh, in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It went off in 1987. This is what the star looked like uh, before it went uh, supernova. There was no obvious sign that something dramatic was going to happen but all of a sudden it blew up. 
Um, it was, became so bright that it was discovered because a graduate student working at night uh, at an observatory walked outside, looked up at the uh, sky and said, oh my gosh, there's a bright star there that I've never seen before. Um, supernovae have also been seen in our own galaxy, but only in historical times. This is the glowing gas cloud left over from a supernova that was, went off in 1054 that was recorded by Chinese and Arab astronomers and also probably um, by Native Americans. Um, the reason that supernova are important for the origin of the elements um, is that all stars, including the sun, uh, make their energy by nuclear reactions. Nuclear fusion is the source of the energy that powers the sun. Um, this has been known on a theoretical basis uh, for many decades, but there's actually remarkably direct evidence that nuclear reactions are going on. Um, one piece of evidence is that the nuclear reactions in the core of the sun produce small particles called neutrinos that interact very weakly with matter and therefore can travel right out of the core of the sun through interplanetary space and through the earth as well. They're occasionally detected by large uh, uh, experimental detectors in underground laboratories such as this one. It's basically just a huge globe uh, filled with very pure water. Occasionally when a neutrino goes through it, it emits a flash of light when it interacts with the water and those flashes are detected by an array of photocells surrounding the, uh, the water. We know that the rate at which neutrinos are coming through the Earth is exactly the rate that's required in order for the sun to burn with the brightness that it has. If the sun, for some unknown reason, turned off its nuclear reactions tomorrow, it would take a million years for it to cool off enough to make a difference to, to us on Earth, but these experiments would know uh, within a matter of minutes. So they have direct evidence that the nuclear reactions are occurring right now. Uh, moreover, if you look at supernovae, the, the light that comes out of one of these brilliant explosions uh, declines exponentially with time here over a period of two years. And the, the rate of decay is exactly the rate of decay that you would expect for radioactive cobalt. We know that radioactive cobalt is produced in vast quantities in a supernova explosion, and the radioactive decay of this newly minted uh, uh, cobalt is precisely what's producing the long tail to the light curve of the supernovae. Um, and finally, uh, some stars show Fraunhofer lines of a particular element, technetium number 43. Technetium, it happens, has no stable form. Uh, the longest lived isotopes of technetium only last about a million years. That says somehow they must have been formed in the star within the last million years, and they must have been formed through ongoing nuclear reactions in the stars. These nuclear reactions, like any uh, burning process, uh, produces ash. Um, as the nuclear reactions go on, the hydrogen and helium in the star is gradually converted um, into heavier elements. And the, the, the great insight that a, uh, astrophysicists had in the 20th century was that it may be that all of the elements that we know of um, beyond hydrogen and helium were produced in the centers of stars. They were produced in the process of stellar burning, then these stars went supernova, expelled the material into the interstellar gas where it was mixed with the primordial gas, reincorporated into stars, and then the process continued through a second and third generation. Um, what the, this, this makes quantitative predictions. Um, it says that initially the star was composed only of hydrogen and helium, which is why they're so abundant. Um, the dip in abundances for these elements is because they're known to be destroyed in nuclear reactions in stars. Um, the gradual decline with increasing atomic number is simply because you have to build these elements up gradually through more and more nuclear reactions uh, in the interiors of the stars. The peak at iron is because iron's an exceptionally stable iron element and it's the natural ash that's produced by nuclear, nuclear reactions in very hot environments. And uh, finally, this kind of sawtooth pattern arises because it turns out the nuclei with odd atomic numbers are less stable than those with even atomic numbers, and the more stable ones turn out to be more abundant. Um, so burning nuclear reactions in stars explains all of the uh, origin of all of the elements except for hydrogen and helium. For those, we have to seek a different explanation, uh, but everything other than hydrogen and helium uh, was made deep inside stars. All of the material in this room, the atoms that you're made of, except for the hydrogen, um, uh, all came from the deep interior of some past 
generation of some past star uh, which uh, exploded. A uh, more poetic way of saying this is that we really are uh, uh, stardust. Um, in order to talk about the origin of hydrogen and helium, um, we have to uh, talk a little bit about cosmology. The most basic fact in cosmology is that the universe is expanding. Um, galaxies that are about 10 million light years away from us are receding from us at about 2,000 kilometers a second. At 100 million light years, they're receding uh, 10 times as fast. If you extrapolate that expansion backwards, um, it says that the universe must have emerged from a singularity, the Big Bang, which occurred about uh, 14 billion years ago. The dynamics of the universe is determined by Einstein's theory of general relativity, and Einstein's theory tells us the, that the geometry of the universe is related to the overall density of matter um, and matter content in the universe. Um, Einstein tells us that there's a critical density. If the average density is now less than the critical density, um, the universe is infinite and will go on expanding forever. Um, if it exceeds the critical density, the universe is finite. Um, and the critical density is actually quite low. It's about one atom per cubic meter, but nevertheless, uh, you know, there's a lot of cubic meters in the universe, and even that very low density is sufficient to eventually make the universe uh, 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 close over on itself and remain finite. Um, when, you go, when you follow the evolution of matter back towards the Big Bang, at earlier times the universe was smaller and so it was denser and hotter. And if you uh, follow the, the physics back uh, right to the Big Bang, what you discover um, is that in the first three minutes of the universe, um, copious amounts of hydrogen and helium and almost no heavier elements um, would be produced from the kind of primordial soup uh, that existed right after the Big Bang. So it seems almost certain that all of the hydrogen and helium that we see in the stars and in the universe was created as part of the Big Bang. Moreover, you produce, the Big Bang produces trace amounts of uh, other elements, and you can compare the relative abundances of hydrogen and helium in the trace elements um, for different models of what happened after the Big Bang. You find that the relative abundances are strongly dependent on the density of uh, matter um, now or after the Big Bang. Um, and what you find is that the correct relative amounts, for example, 23% helium, as you see in the sun, are all obtained for all these different elements if and only if the density of matter in the universe at present is exactly 4% of the critical density. So we don't know why that 4% is correct, but we're very confident that um, getting the relative abundances of the elements in the universe correct requires that the density of matter has this precise ratio to the critical density. Um, I put up this uh, 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 book cover simply because this was really nicely described in a book written by uh, Steven Weinberg um, with the famous title, The First Three Minutes, because in his view, that was when almost all of the properties of the universe um, were determined. So that kind of ends the, the very quick summary of uh, uh, what's uh, of the history of astrophysics, and to summarize it, um, the Copernican principle says that we're not located at a special place in the universe or a special time in its history. That the laws of physics we investigate in the lab also govern the behavior of astronomical objects, and that it, in reciprocity, the study of these objects can reveal new laws of physics. The sun and the stars are made of the same elements as the Earth, and these elements were some made in the Big Bang and some in uh, nuclear reactions um, in the centers of stars. Um, and this um, synergy between physics and astronomy, of course, is the reason why the discipline of astrophysics uh, emerged as, as one of the most interesting subjects um, in science through this merger of uh, astronomy and physics. Um, so this is a wonderful uh, success story. Um, however, around the middle of the 20th century, some of its successes began to uh, unravel. Um, some of the first clues came from looking um, at the, ro the rotation speed of stars in, in uh, galaxies. You can measure the rotation of a star like the sun around the center of a galaxy. And just as Newton predicted uh, from universal gravitation uh, for the speeds of the planets as you went out from the sun, um, once you get out to the outer parts of a galaxy, the speeds of the stars in the outer parts of the galaxy should fall off in precisely the same way that the speeds of the planets uh, fall off from the sun? Um, the answer is that they don't. Instead of falling off like this, the speeds at which stars go around, typically maybe one or 200 kilometers per second, 
um, remain flat and independent of radius and don't fall off. This is a schematic view. This is actual data, which shows the discrepancy be between what you'd expect um, and what you actually see. Um, it's emerged that there are only two possible explanations for this that are consistent with all the data. Either Newton was wrong. For some reasons, his law of gravity doesn't work on the scale of galaxies, even though it seems to work extremely well in every context we've been able to test it. Or the galaxies must have some vast amounts of matter, at least two or three times as much as they have in stars and gas, um, sitting in their, in their outer parts, which are putting in additional gravitational force that's keeping the... Um, uh, the rotation speed's high. Well, this is such a remarkable and surprising conclusion that you go looking for, for more evidence. Um, other evidence comes from satellite galaxies of our own. In addition to the uh, Magellanic Clouds, our galaxy is surrounded by several dozen small satellite galaxies before you get out to the next big galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, these galaxies are very small. They have typically only somewhere between a thousand and a few hundred thousand stars, many orders of magnitude less than the Milky Way. In some cases, like this one and this one, um, their star density is so low that you can hardly convince yourself uh, that you're seeing something there. Nevertheless, you can measure the velocities of these stars in the same way, way that you measure velocities of stars in much larger galaxies. You can use Newton's laws to calculate the amount of mass uh, that's in the galaxies to give the stars their uh, motions if they're in equilibrium. And what you find is even more remarkable that these galaxies um, have up to 100 times more dark matter than they do in stars, not just two or three times, but one or two orders of magnitude uh, more than you'd expect just from the things that you can see. So there's dark matter in very small galaxies. There also turns out to be dark matter in very large systems. This is a cluster of galaxies. What you're seeing is a whole set of uh, point-like sources with our foreground stars in our own galaxy. If you look past the intervening stars in our own galaxy, um, you see these large, fuzzy, sort of yellowish and bluish uh, galaxies. These are all at the same, roughly the same distance. They're part of a cluster of galaxies. Um, they're orbiting around one another uh, as a result of their mutual self-gravity. These are, clusters are some of the largest equilibrium structures in the universe. Um, and once again, if you believe Newton's laws, you can apply these laws to calculate um, the mass that uh, must be there to hold the cluster of galaxies together and compare it to the mass that you know is in the stars in these objects. And when you do that, you find that the masses of every cluster that you look at is about five times as large as the total mass you can ascribe to the stars and gas um, in the cluster. Again, a remarkable conclusion. Um, you'd like to have some independent evidence that it's correct, and fortunately, uh, there is such evidence. Uh, this is an example of a rather distant cluster of galaxies. All of the kind of uh, uh, yellowish objects are uh, galaxies um, in the cluster. A few bright objects with uh, the spikes rising from um, the optics of the telescope are foreground stars. But you also notice these curious blue objects um, sprinkled, around the, uh, uh, sprinkled around the cluster. Um, if you, and somehow they all look kind of strange. If you um, expand the images and sort of squash them in the right way, um, you get images that look like this. And not only do these look a little strange, but they all look the same. That is, each one of the images has a big blob here. Um, it's sort of ring-like, and it has a little extra structure here. The reason these images all look the same is that they're all the same object. Um, what's happened is that according to Einstein's theory, mass can bend light. Um, and this cluster has enough mass that it's acting like a giant lens and imaging a galaxy that happens to lie at a much larger distance far behind it and creating um, several separate images of the galaxy. Now, this is not a lens that you'd like to have in your uh, glasses. You don't want five images of everything, but gravity you know, isn't designed to make, um, uh, to make good images, and so you often get uh, multiple uh, features like this. Um, you can understand this in a little more detail by imagining an, a thought experiment in which there's a uh, mass here, and uh, this source in green goes past it. The blue marks the um, <coughs> images that you'd get of this source that, that coincide with the source at large distances but the images split and move away as it crosses close to the, the lensing mass. So this extra mass has two effects. 
Um, it splits, it distorts the image and splits it into two, and it can also magnify the image uh, so that the, the brightness of the, the combined images goes through a characteristic curve like this. Um, if the image, if the source was exactly behind the, the, the lensing mass, so the you and the lensing mass and the source were along the same line, then the source wouldn't provide two images, it would be split into a perfectly symmetrical ring, which is called the Einstein ring. Um, in the case of uh, the cluster that we looked at, the motion of the foreground and background galaxies, of course, only occurs over cosmic times. It's much too slow uh, to see any motion. But to get some idea <coughs> of uh, how it actually behaves, um, you can make a movie in which you take the a whole set of background galaxies, which you can think of as wallpaper, and slide them past the uh, intervening cluster. Um, you can see this, you can sort of see hints of the Einstein ring here. It's not perfect because they're never precisely in line. You can see some distortions as the galaxies go past individual foreground galaxies. But most of the distortion is from the cluster itself. Um, and because we understand how much mass bends, uh, bends the light, we can uh, use this to determine the mass of the cluster. Could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so you can use that to get an independent measurement of the mass of the cluster. The mass agrees with the mass that you determine from the motion of the galaxies in Newton's law of gravity. So we have very firm evidence that in these extremely large systems, the total mass is about five times the mass that you can ascribe uh, to the stars and the, the gas. Um, so the conclusion from all of these results is that every measurement we make of galaxies and galaxy clusters on large scales shows that the mass in stars and gas is only a fraction of the total mass. The conclusion must be that the vast majority of the matter in the universe is in some unknown and invisible form, and the next natural question is, um, what is it? Well, in principle, it could be rocks. Uh, that's not very likely because we know most of the mass is probably hydrogen and helium, and it's hard to make rocks out of hydrogen and helium. Could be very faint stars, so faint that we can't uh, detect them, although nobody, many people have looked and not discovered them. It could be planets, although those are usually found around stars. And of course, they could be black holes, which are, of course, very good at hiding themselves. Um, the best way to, it turns out that the key for figuring out which, if any, of these possibilities is correct is once again gravitational lensing, but this time not of galaxies by clusters of galaxies, but of stars or other objects by other stars. Now, because the mass of a star is so small compared to the mass of a galaxy, the image splitting that you get is much too small to detect. But the magnification um, that you expect from the lensing is still present. Moreover, the size of the Einstein ring is so small that you can expect to see that traversal of the Einstein ring if you monitor a star uh, for a few weeks or months. Whoops. Um, so um, the way this works, again, if, is that you're, you're watching the uh, change in the brightness of a star um, as it uh, is lensed by an intervening object. Um, you can detect these events. This is a, an example of real data showing a curve that looks exactly like this. Now, if you're going to try to find these, because these are such rare events, you want to look somewhere where um, there's a lot of background stars. The two best places to look are either the center of the galaxy, um, where there's a vast number of stars, or the Magellanic Clouds. And, and astronomers have um, looked at both places. Basically, what they do is they pick a field of view, and they simply stare at it every clear night for month after month, um, looking for uh, events like this that take place over a few months. If you look at the geometry, if you look at the center of the galaxy, you're looking through an intervening uh, set of stars here, and so you should see gravitational lensing by the intervening stars, and that provides a check on whether you, your method is working, because you know the stars are there. If you look at the Magellanic Cloud, because it's a long way from the disk of the galaxy, and there's not very many stars here, but there's a lot of dark matter, then if the dark matter is black holes, or planets, or very faint stars, you sh should see gravitational lensing by the, by the dark matter. Um, the conclusion is that you do see stars lensed by intervening stars if you look in this direction, you don't see stars lensed uh, in this direction, and the conclusion is simply that the dark matter uh, between us and the Magellanic Cloud can't be any of these uh, 
can't be any of these. Um, so conclusion number one is that we, since we don't see any gravitational lensing from the dark matter in the Milky Way, it can't be any compact uh, object like this. But there's a second, even more powerful argument. Um, we know that you only create the right amount of helium in the Big Bang if the density of ordinary matter is 4% of the critical density. But when you go out and look at all these clusters of galaxies, the average density of the dark matter is five times larger, or about 20% of the critical density. That means that the dark matter can't be any of these, or in fact can't be any object, no matter how strange, that's made out of ordinary matter, because then you'd get the wrong amount of helium uh, in the sun. Uh, the conclusion is that the dark matter has to be some sort of exotic form of matter that's never found on Earth, never seen in the stars, has never been created in any laboratory or ex experiment or accelerator. Uh, it must be some exotic and completely unknown uh, form of matter, probably some as yet undiscovered elementary particle that was produced in huge amounts uh, in the Big Bang. Um, trying to find this particle um, is one of the major themes of experimental physics and astrophysics in the next decade. There's an armada of different experiments um, that are trying to find it. Um, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope is looking for uh, uh, gamma ray signals from uh, dark matter in the, the halo of the galaxy. It was launched uh, last spring. There are dark matter searches where you bury an extremely sensitive detector in an underground mine and look for occasional interactions with uh, dark matter particles uh, from the galactic halo. It's possible that the Large Hadron Collider, which is being turned on uh, this fall and winter in Geneva, uh, will produce uh, some of the dark matter particles. The most exotic experiment is called Ice Cube. Uh, it's being uh, an experiment that's being set up at the South Pole in which they use the Antarctic ice cap as a giant uh, detector. They basically pump hot water down holes, melt the ice, drop a string of uh, uh, detectors down the uh, down the hole, let it refreeze, and then uh, monitor throughout, uh, throughout the year the Antarctic ice looking for uh, flashes of light from dark matter particles that are interacting uh, with the ice. Okay, well, we don't know what the nature of this exotic dark matter is, but we can still work with it. We know that the total density of matter is 25% of, of the critical density. And as I said before, Einstein's theory tells us that the geometry of the universe is determined by its dark matter content relative to the critical density. The density is above the critical density. The universe is finite. Uh, a two-dimensional analog of the curvature of space looks like this. A more proper statement is that if you send two people off in uh, opposite directions, eventually the distance between them would be less than you would expect if space were flat. Uh, if the average density is less than the critical density, this is a more appropriate representation. If it equals the critical density, then space is flat, just the kind of flat space that we're familiar with. Moreover, since it's, it's ordinary matter and mass is conserved, we can calculate how that density varies relative to the critical density earlier in the universe, and so we can deduce the expansion history of the universe. So we can, if we assume that um, this is the correct uh, inventory of the uh, constituents of the universe, we can calculate what the geometry of the universe should be and compare it with observations. One way to do this is to look at the relation between distance and brightness for supernovae, because these supernovae uh, seem to all have the same uh, peak brightness. Um, and we know that in a flat universe, the brightness of a, a standard uh, source of light falls off like one over the square of the distance. Um, so this plots, for example, the distance to these supernovae um, against their brightness. Uh, this is a somewhat expanded plot which shows the prediction that you uh, would make um, in the model I've described where the total matter density is 25% of critical. You can see that it works pretty well, although I have to say, you know, it kind of looks like it's a little high here. Um, you can also look at the large-scale distribution of galaxies. We now have uh, surveys of the distribution of, of galaxies that have um, millions of galaxies in them, tens of millions of galaxies in them. The galaxies are not distributed completely at random, um, but rather they show correlations that can be analyzed statistically and that depend on the history of the universe. Could you run the uh, uh, video, please? So this is, whoops. Uh, Let's go back. 
Let's try that again. Just click on it. Um, so this is a, a, a imitation voyage in which we start at the sun um, and uh, move outwards from the sun at an ever accelerating speed. Um, and all of the galaxies, I mean, each of these represents a real galaxy. These are all galaxies that have been uh, measured in uh, uh, this particular survey, the Sloan uh, Sky Survey. Um, and what you can, should look for is um, uh, patterns in the distribution of galaxy. you shouldn't, galaxies. You shouldn't be distracted by the fact that you see some streaks here. That's because the survey doesn't cover the whole volume of the sky, um, simply because it was taken from New Mexico and some parts of the sky aren't accessible uh, from New Mexico. Um, so as you look at this, you can start to see um, what look like um, filaments here and here in the distribution of galaxies. Uh, this is just rotating uh, the distribution. The filament here voids where there are relatively few galaxies and a curious sort of web-like or bubble-like structure in which there are areas of uh, high density of galaxies surrounding low densities and areas um, that almost look like filaments. Um, all of these properties um, are, are determined by how galaxies cluster and form um, in the expanding universe and if they're analyzed correctly they tell you what the uh, geometry and the history of the universe uh, has been. Um, you can also look at the age of the universe as measured from the oldest stars and compare that to what you would expect from your model of the history of the universe. You can also look at small irregularities on um, the background radiation left over from the Big Bang. Um, the answer is that all of these independent estimates all agree that the correct model um, is that the universe is flat. Uh, that's good because it means you don't have to pay a lot of attention to trying to understand geometry in curved space, which I always find difficult. Um, what's, uh, what's maybe not so good is that since the universe is flat, Einstein's theory then says that what we've identified, the ordinary matter and the exotic matter, is not sufficient. There must be something extra containing almost three times as much matter uh, as we've identified in order that you add up to 100% of the critical density. Um, that remaining 76% is variously known as dark energy or cosmological constant or vacuum energy. Most likely it's simply the quantum energy um, associated with empty space. The idea of uh, a cosmological constant was first introduced by Einstein as a kind of ad hoc uh, modification to general relativity in which he just took his standard general relativity equations and added this extra term. He famously called it his biggest blunder, although um, I think that th that wasn't because um, he didn't believe it could be correct, but because he introduced it as a repulsive term to balance the attraction of gravity so that you could have a static universe. And shortly after he'd done it, Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding and what Einstein was kicking himself for was the fact that if he'd had the courage to stick with his original equations, he could have predicted that the universe had to be expanding. Um, dark energy exerts a negative gravitational force. That's why Einstein was interested in it. Uh, what that means now is that the uh, expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. Um, the difficulty with dark energy is that despite um, Einstein's early use of it, um, the theoretical estimates with a more sophisticated understanding of particle physics now imply that either it should be exactly zero or it should be 60 to 100 orders of magnitude larger than what we observe, neither of which is obviously uh, correct. Um, so the, the nature of the cosmological constant or the dark energy, why it has the value that it does, I think is one of the major mysteries that uh, particle physics and astrophysics are going to have to solve um, over the next decades. Um, nevertheless, even though, though we don't understand it, once again, we can work with it. If we augment uh, uh, the model of ordinary matter and exotic matter with uh, dark energy, we can ask how well it fits the properties of the, the universe that we have. You remember I showed this plot of the brightness of supernovae as a function of distance. Uh, I said they were a little bit above the curve just for um, ordinary matter and exotic matter. Um, the curve, if you include dark energy, falls right through the middle of these uh, points, so it uh, fits uh, perfectly. Um, the large-scale distribution of, of galaxies, the theoretical predictions look like these lines with the, uh, here and here with this little bump. There's the data. Once again, it agrees perfectly. The age of the universe agrees perfectly with the age of the oldest stars. 
um, the small irregularities in the cosmic background radiation. This is uh, technically a plot of the power spectrum of that radiation, those fluctuations depending on angular scale. This is the data, um, and this is the uh, theoretical prediction, and every little bump and wiggle that you see um, is exactly reproduced um, in the data. So even though we don't understand the vast majority of the content of the universe, once we're willing to accept this, um, we have a model for almost all of the observational properties on large scales of the universe that fits all of the data extremely well. Um, not only does it fit all the data extremely well, but we can actually make very precise statements about many of the properties of the universe. Uh, the average density of the universe is equal to the critical density to remarkable accuracy within better than 1%. That means the geometry of the universe um, is very nearly flat. That's entirely consistent with the predictions of theories of the very early universe based on what's called inflationary cosmology. Remarkably, we can tell you the age of the universe 13.7 billion years within a couple of percent. The density of ordinary matter is actually 4.2% of the critical density, and certainty in that's only two-tenths of a percent. On the largest scales, the universe is isotropic, looks the same in all directions to about 10 parts per million or better. So we really have some very precise understanding of the properties of the universe, um, but um, an extraordinary lack of understanding of what the nature of these two uh, uh, components are. Um, let me move on uh, to the last subject that I'll talk about, which is evidence for uh, black holes um, in the universe, a kind of third kind of um, uh, object that you don't see um, on the Earth. The idea of black holes is very simple and very old. It's just that if you have an object that's sufficiently massive and sufficiently dense, um, even light isn't going to be able to escape from it. It was first suggested by an English clergyman uh, uh, over 200 years ago, but a consistent description of black holes only came about through Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, the interior of a black hole, the region inside what's called its event horizon, is invisible, and anything that enters the event horizon can never come out again to report on what it saw. Um, nevertheless, the black hole may reveal its presence because of its uh, uh, influence on nearby matter. That influence would include gravitational lensing. We've talked about that already. Its gravitational force can affect the orbits of nearby stars, and if there's gas orbiting the black hole, then frictional heating from the very strong shear uh, in the gas can heat the gas to a very high temperature where you may be able to see it um, in X-rays. It's worth remembering that black holes really are very small. The event horizon, if you collapse the sun into a black hole, the event horizon would only be three kilometers uh, in radius. Um, so that's the theoretical uh, construction of black holes. Um, I want to then turn to an apparently unrelated phenomenon, which is the quasars. Um, when the first radio surveys of, were built, were, when the first radio telescopes were built and used to make surveys uh, of the sky, they discovered that some of the strongest radio sources were ordinary galaxies, but others were unusual uh, star-like objects that when you looked at them just seemed to be point sources of light just like stars. And that's, of course, the origin of the name. They were called quasi-stellar uh, objects or quasars. They were first thought to be some sort of unusual star in the Milky Way, but um, were soon discovered uh, to be not in the Milky Way, but in fact more distant than almost all other objects known in the universe, something like 100 million times further away. Since brightness goes off like the square of the distance, if they're 100 million times further away, they have to be extremely in, intense sources of radiation. Uh, quasars turned out to be very small, bright um, objects located in the centers of galaxies. The reason they looked starlight is simply that the quasars were so bright that they drowned out uh, all the light uh, from the galaxy. Um, so quasars, like supernovae, um, can exceed the total light from all the stars in the galaxy by a factor of 100 or so. What's different is that the supernovae are only bright for a period of a few weeks or months. Quasars shine for millions or maybe even hundreds of millions of years, and therefore are the strongest uh, steady sources of energy in the universe uh, by far. Um, this is an example of a couple of quasars. Uh, these pictures don't show the full brilliance of the quasar because they've been specially enhanced to bring out the galaxy behind them. You can see these are pretty ordinary looking galaxies with this extraordinarily bright source um, sitting in the middle of them. 
One of the other curious features of quasars is that the number of quasars isn't constant. This shows the uh, density of quasars, the number of quasars in a fixed volume in the universe, even accounting for the expansion of the universe, and how it depends on time since the Big Bang. Um, and you can see that um, the density of quasars about two or three billion years after the Big Bang is something like two orders of magnitude, a factor of almost 100 bigger than it is now. So somehow, in contrast to almost all other objects in the universe, you formed a lot of quasars and then they disappeared. And the peak sort of uh, epoch of quasar activity was when the universe was only two billion years old, about 20 or 30 percent of its current age. Um, the thesis that I'd like to put forward is that these two objects, black holes and quasars, are the same. That is, the quasars are uh, black holes with masses somewhere between a million and a billion times the mass of the sun that are shining, emitting this extraordinary radiation uh, from superheated gas that's slowly spiraling into the black hole and in turn making it grow uh, even more massive. There's a wide variety of evidence uh, for this. Um, one is that quasars emit um, jets of uh, uh, particles and radiation. Um, this is actually emitting a jet in both this direction and this one. This one isn't visible because it's fainter because the jet's traveling so fast that it's dimmed by relativistic effects. Eventually, the jet plows into, the, into gas in between the galaxies and makes this huge hot bubble. Um, the time it takes the jet to get from the quasar out to here is about a million years, even though the jet is moving at close to the speed of light. Um, and you can see that despite that, over that million year interval, the jet is absolutely straight. And the reason for that has to be that whatever is producing the jet is an extremely stable, uh, has an extremely stable direction. And a very good way to do that is to have a spinning black hole in, that sends the jet out along its pole. Um, this is an example of a smaller jet from a relatively nearby galaxy. If you expand um, the view near the center of the jet, you can see blobs. And if you follow those blobs over a four-year period, you can watch them move outward. The speed at which they're moving outward is a substantial fraction of the speed of light. And the only way we know to make things that are moving that fast is with the intense gravitational field close to a black hole. Um, quasars also vary. They're not steady sources. They fluctuate up and down on time scales of months. That says that their size has to be very small because it's almost impossible for a naturally occurring object uh, to coordinate um, whether it's going up or down in brightness on two scales that are separated by more than the time it takes light to travel across that distance because nothing can travel faster uh, than light. That says that the quasars have to be smaller than the distance light can travel in a month. That's only about 100 times the size of the solar system. We now have even tighter constraints that say that, in fact, the size of the quasar is less than the size of the solar system. So you have to think of these things as emitting 100 billion times the luminosity of the sun from a volume that's smaller than the distance between uh, the sun and Pluto. Um, a final argument uh, for uh, uh, why black holes are the energy source for quasars is simply efficiency. Everyone thinks these days about the efficiency of uh, energy conversion. Well, using Einstein's uh, relation between energy and mass e equals mc squared, you can define a natural efficiency for any radiative process, which is just the ratio of the fuel it uses times c squared to the energy it puts out. On these standards, our ordinary uh, chemical engines are extremely inefficient. Gasoline has an efficiency that's uh, nine zeros followed by a three. Nuclear reactors are much more efficient with an efficiency of about one part in a thousand. Black holes are the most efficient um, engines that we know of. They'll convert something like um, 10 to 30 percent of the in, uh, rest mass energy in their fuel into, uh, into radiation. As a measure of how efficient they are, if, if you know, if we could solve our energy problems by keeping a black hole uh, in the closet, um, the black hole could survive all of the U.S. energy needs with a fuel supply of less than 100 pounds a day. Um, the reason this is important is that, as I've said, quasars emit enormous amounts of energy for a very long time. Given their total energy output, the fuel supply by that they require, even by astronomical standards, is absolutely prohibitive unless they have efficiencies uh, that are comparable to this amount. 
Um, well, if we believe that black holes are the power source for quasars, and if the present abundance of quasars is much less than their abundance early in the history of the universe, and if quasars are found in the center of galaxies, then since the black holes didn't go away, many nearby galaxies must contain uh, inert black holes or dead quasars sitting in their centers. And the next obvious question is, well, if that's true, can we find them? The natural place to look first is the Milky Way. Uh, you've seen this picture before. On this picture, in terms of light years, a thousand light years is something like uh, that distance. If you expand the view of the center of the galaxy, which is where you would look for such a black hole, um, this is a view on a scale of uh, a few light years. If you expand yet again, um, you get a view that looks like this um, on scales of maybe 100 light days. Um, this is an image that was taken in 1992 when astronomers have monitored the center of the galaxy continuously over the last 15 years. Um, and watched how the stars move close to the center uh, of the galaxy. So I'm going to show a, a short video showing how the, the stars move and then um, expanding still further to look on an even smaller scale. So could you run the, the video, please? Uh, can you run the video? No, nope, back. OK, try it again. Uh, nope, back. Uh, nope. You should be getting a little hand. There. Okay, just click on it. Okay, if you expand inwards, those are the motions of the stars over the last 15 years. The little cross is the location of a radio source, which is widely believed to mark the center of the galaxy. And what you can see from this star in particular it's a, is that it's exhibiting the orbit um, of something which goes slowly out here, much faster here. And it's clearly orbiting around some condensed mass uh, close to this point. Um, OK, can we go on? Uh, OK. Um, if you analyze the, those, those orbits, what you find is that all of these stars have to be orbiting an object whose mass is four million times the mass of the sun, but whose size is less than the distance from the Earth to Pluto. There's no known object other than a black hole that could have these properties. Um, so we're not getting down to the event horizon. That's much smaller, only about 10% of the Earth-Sun distance. But we're clearly in a situation where we have no conceivable object that we can think of other than a black hole. Um, to explain what's happening at the center of our galaxy. Um, you can see this in other similar phenomena in other galaxies as well. This is an otherwise undistinguished uh, spiral galaxy, um, but it happens to have gas uh, near its center, which is located in a disk and has conditions such that um, it's acting like a natural laser or more properly a maser. It's emitting very strong, coherent uh, radiation um, that um, enables us to map the kinematics these spots extremely close, carefully. When you do that, you see that the spots here have a speed as a function of radius that looks like this. The dots here have a speed that looks like this. This is exactly what you see, um, again, from Newton's law, for the motion of the planets. It implies that you can calculate uh, that there must be a central mass in here. You can calculate the mass. It's 40 million solar masses with an uncertainty of only 2%. There's no known object, again, other than a black hole that can be that massive and that small. Um, the final argument is that even though you, you can be confident that you're seeing black holes in the center of, by now, several dozen nearby galaxies, um, you don't know that those are the black holes that are left over uh, from the, the quasar epoch. But in fact, you, there is a very powerful indirect argument that it is. Um, we know how much energy the quasars emitted during the history of the universe. We know roughly the efficiency of uh, accretion of matter onto a black hole. And so that means that the total mass of what you might call ash that's left over from the, quasar, um, from the quasars has to be around five to 10,000 solar masses in a box of a million light years on its side. You can also go out to all the nearby galaxies. You can ask how much mass there is in the black holes we've found in their centers. 
it's eight to 14,000 solar masses in a box of the same size. This agreement is so good that unless it's an incredible coincidence, it says almost certainly that the black holes that we're seeing um, are the remnants of dead quasars. They're objects that once shone as quasars and now probably have been starved of fuel and are now inert. Okay, um, let me then summarize. Uh, I'll summarize by going back to the um, simple view of uh, 20th century astrophysics um, that I described at the start of the talk, that we're not located at a special place in the universe, that the laws of physics that we investigate in the lab govern the behavior of astronomical objects, that the study of astronomy can reveal new laws of physics, and the sun and stars are made of the same elements of the Earth. Um, the first of these, um, we actually now have a kind of super Copernican principle. Not only are we not a special place or a special time, we're not even made of a special material. Uh, the vast majority of the material in the universe is either dark energy or dark matter. And there, in a, addition to these, there's a small amount of sort of leftover pollutant of hydrogen and helium and uh, uh, all the other elements that we know and everything that the Earth um, and the stars are made of. Um, the laws of physics that we investigate in the lab govern the behavior of astronomical objects. The prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity that black holes exist has been confirmed. There's now indisputable evidence that very massive black holes exist. The question that we hope to be able to uh, investigate in the ne next decade or two is whether their properties conform exactly with the predictions of Einstein's theory, which are very strong. We hope to be able to do that by detecting gravitational waves from merging uh, black holes. And finally, one of the most remarkable predictions of theoretical physics in the 20th century, uh, the existence of black holes has been confirmed by one of the dramatic discoveries of observational astronomy, that is, the quasars. Um, not only can the study of astronomy reveal new laws of physics, but as the cost of accelerators grows, it's likely that studying astronomy is going to be one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful method we have for discovering new physics in the 21st century. Um, and finally, although it's true that the sun and stars are made of the same elements as the Earth, first of all, most of the universe isn't. Um, and second, ironically, Plato's original idea of an ether, of an immutable, unchangeable fifth element, uh, has now been resurrected. Such an element, if you call it now dark energy instead of uh, the ether, um, comprises something like three quarters of the total mass and energy of the universe and trying to understand its nature and its connection to the rest of the laws of physics is going to be one of the central problems for uh, physics in the 21st century. All right, I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, Peter has told me that uh, I can answer questions until he runs his hand across his throat. Uh, yes. Um, the Institute will uh, make the, um, the slides and uh, video of the lecture available on their, on their website. I think that's correct, yes. Well, given the puzzles that I've presented, it's of course always good to be cautious. Um, but the statement that um, uh, nothing travels faster than the speed of light um, is a statement um, that follows from the requirements of uh, the theory of relativity and the requirement that um, uh, events can't be a-causal, that is that uh, you can't go back and you know, kill your grandmother. Um, so at the moment, um, if 
we believe Einstein's theory is correct, and, and that's still a, only a tentative discussion because it hasn't been fully reconciled uh, with, with quantum mechanics. Um, it's not just that we can't see anything that travels faster than the speed of light, but you can't have anything go faster than the speed of light without getting into severe contradictions in the laws of physics. Um, well, I, I agree that black holes are, are very efficient. Not only are they, uh, uh, they're attractive, not only are they efficient, but if you have things like radioactive waste, you may as well just use them as the fuel, throw them in, and then nothing will ever, uh, you know, then you really have disposed of them. Um, the difficulties are that the black holes that might be created in the Large Hadron Collider um, are extremely tiny and, and will only survive for a infinitesimal fraction of a second and therefore um, are a very long way from anything that um, we might be able to uh, use. And of course, the other difficulty is that um, black holes are pretty difficult to control. Yes. Um, it, it's most likely that um, dark matter um, will not form black holes. One of the attractive features of, uh, one of the interesting features of, of dark matter is obviously the reason that it's dark and so difficult to detect is that um, it doesn't interact uh, electromagnetically with uh, ordinary matter. That means that its interactions are only gravity and the weak, inter possibly the weak interaction. Those interactions are extremely weak and although in principle you could imagine processes that might make black holes out of uh, uh, dark matter. Um, our best current, we, we, there's no reason to think that those will happen, and our best current estimate is that the only influence that the, the, dark, mat that the dark matter will be relatively smoothly distributed. So you can't rule it out, but um, nobody has proposed any mechanism by which they could contribute significantly to the population of black holes. Um, that, 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 that's a very reasonable point. I think, first, first of all, the reason that the flatness of the universe is not a concern for the Copernican principle is that theories of the very early universe based on inflationary cosmology imply that um, an early stage of inflation in the universe naturally produce a universe that's extremely close to being flat. What is a problem for the Copernican principle is that in such models, the relative amounts of dark energy and dark matter change with, with time, and for most of the history of the universe, it's either entirely dominated by dark matter or entirely dominated by dark energy. And it's somewhat anti-Copernican to say that we're in the, the relatively short fraction of the history of the universe in which there are comparable amounts of dark energy and dark matter. Uh, so um, this implies to some people, as the Copernican principle often does, that we're making a serious mistake. But you know, the principle, uh, the whole usefulness of the principle, the continuing usefulness of the principle is that uh, it may be telling us that we're making a mistake. Yes. Um, well, they, the, the simplest way to see it is that um, uh, very small black holes um, emit what's called Hawking radiation after Stephen Hawking. Um, they spontaneously create particles and antiparticles, one of which travels inside the event horizon and one of which goes outside. That means that they're basically um, emitting radiation. The amount of radiation they emit by this process um, is totally negligible for black holes of the kind we're talking here, many times the mass of the sun. For the microscopic black holes, that process is extremely efficient and basically it means 
that they uh, uh, evaporate on an extremely short uh, time scale. Um, no, um, so that, that's obviously an alternative and, um, a large, and many people have uh, tried to think about whether you can come up with an alternative theory of gravity. What you really like is to come up with one which would explain both dark matter and dark energy in one natural way. Um, nobody has really succeeded in doing that and in fact one of the lessons that we learned from Einstein is coming, that coming up with consistent um, models of gravity that aren't extraordinarily Baroque um, is very difficult and uh, it's proved very hard for people to come up with uh, compelling theories of gravity that can do away with the dark matter. That hasn't stopped people from trying and uh, it's obviously an effort that's very worthwhile to continue. Um, but the bulk of, uh, uh, the bulk of uh, researchers prefer to think that there's uh, just some kind of matter that we haven't discovered yet rather than throw out the whole um, apparatus of all the laws of physics that we know of. But they might be wrong. The question was whether the relation that I showed um, for supernovae was between uh, distance and uh, luminosity or redshift and luminosity, and you're correct. Um, we can't measure the uh, uh, distance directly. What you can measure is the redshift, which is related um, to the distance through the expansion of the universe. So really it's a relation between the apparent brightness that you see and the redshift that the system is at. That's correct. Um, yes, that is the, the belief is that initially, the, shortly after the formation of the universe, the dark matter and the normal matter was distributed in the same way, um, but that uh, because the normal matter can interact through, you know, is, because it's visible, um, it can uh, give off energy through light. That means that as uh, the, the two kinds of material collapse to form a galaxy, there's a separation the um, ordinary matter can cool, release energy, and sink lower in the gravitational potential, and the dark matter is kind of left on the outsides. So it's not, the way to think of it is not that the dark matter um, has been pushed to the outside, but that the stuff we see has, has uh, sunken into the middle. Yes? Um, if we had a quasar in the middle of the galaxy, um, Nadia, Nadia knows much more about quasars than I do. Um, I think the answer is no. That is, the center of the galaxy is about, uh, no, the, ans the answer is no. It would not be brighter than the sun. The sun is, obvi it's obviously intrinsically much brighter than the sun, but uh, it's so much further away that the sun would, uh, the sun would win. Um, well, you would have some difficulty because there's so much uh, dust and small particles between us and the center of the galaxy that, um, that it would um, obscure the quasar. But if you went, say, to the next nearest galaxy, to the Andromeda galaxy, um, and there was a quasar in the center of that, that would easily be visible during the day. Yes. Um, the, the, the observations only consisted of the observation 
that uh, there was what the Chinese called a guest star. That is, the Chinese astronomers said um, there is a, a new star appeared. It was very bright, you know, brighter than these other stars, and its location was in such and such a constellation between star A and star B. And uh, the reason we know that's correct is that first, the location that they identified coincides very well with the center of that glowing cloud of gas uh, that, that we see, and second, that uh, from the expansion of the gas, you can extrapolate backwards, figure out when the gas must have exploded, and it coincides very well with, with 1054. Um, in, in principle, yes, because obviously everything with mass attracts everything else with mass. But um, you know, although black holes are very impressive, on the scale of the galaxy, the black hole that we're talking about is very small. It's only uh, uh, one millionth of the total mass of the galaxy. So in principle, it's correct that there is an interaction. In principle, for instance, the black hole is slowly growing because it's accreting the, the dark matter. But the scale of the galaxy as a whole is so large and the density of the dark matter is so low that in practice, although both the black hole and the dark matter are dark, they're completely independent uh, phenomena. Okay, uh, Peter is uh, slicing his throat, so thank you very much. Thank you.